Testing, one, two, testing, one, two. Hello, hello. Hello, hello. It's all right. Now, morning. How y'all? Man, it, it's filling back up. It looks good. It's filling back up. Um, prayer request for Matthew Jones. Um, keep him in your prayers. He is home now. He got home Friday, I think it was, He said, uh, Rick told me. So, uh... Just keep a little Matthew in your prayers at all times. Um, birthdays. Gwendolyn. Carol. Melissa Spears, the 25th. Gwendolyn's 24th. Um, opportunities to serve. Still need somebody. They really need it bad. If y'all want to turn and look and see who's up there. Um, I got Daryl Ed up there, so... <laughs> We need a little help up there in a the little booth. <laughs> uh, it's empty still. Um, last week was a little joke that I, Greg told me to take notes, and I put on there, uh, thank you, Lord. And uh, I get out every morning and, and run walk up a hill there, and uh, I always thank him. But, and I thought it was a joke there last week when I gave it to him and stuff. And I started thinking going home. I thought, man, you know, that's nice to say. It's nice to say to anybody, thank you. But if you don't show it, and, I, you know, I fall short all the time. I thank him every morning. Thank you for this beautiful sky and stuff. But I, I probably don't show him enough what thank you really means to me. So, uh it was a joke, but then I started thinking real hard, and I thought, man, I'm falling down when I don't show him. So when you say thank you, put a little more special into it, because I, I will from now on. Um, the verse I'm going to read for you is out of 1 John chapter 3, if I can find 21 and 22. Dear friends, if your hearts do not condemn us, we have confidence before God and receive from Him anything we ask because we obey His commands and do what pleases Him. So let's go please Him. Please stand and we'll sing two songs for our ultimate prayer. Technology. you today we lift up our voices we open our hearts we open our hearts Lord to hear you open our eyes father today so that we can see what you see 
Help us to worship you, Father, in truth and in spirit. Help us, Father, to see the things that, that you lay on us every day in our relationships with others, because that's the key. You tell us that you don't want our worship if we don't love one another. What does that tell us? You looked at Adam and you said, you know what? I've made all these things and yet you're still lonely. Let me make another human. Help us, Father, with our relationships. Help us to seek your face through everyone. Help us to see others through our mask now that we're wearing those. But Father, we just thank you for loving us. Help us to be thankful. Help us every day to thank you for, for the blessings, for the air that we breathe, the food that we have, the water that we consume. Help us to realize that without the air that you provide, we don't exist. Be with us today as we, we go about this service, that we take this service and we apply it, that we show others around us through love who Jesus is. Father, we thank you for Matthew and being able to return home. Father, we pray for that family. We pray for everyone who, who is in need of you. Be with us. Love us. Help us to love others. In Jesus' name, amen.
as we come to the, as we come to this time period of of Jesus dying on the cross for us, he not only died for us, or he died in for people in Lewis County or for the U.S., but he died for people throughout the world. <clears throat> Being involved in World English Institute, um, the reason that one of the reasons it's called World in English Institute and not World Bible Institute is because people in some of the other countries, such as your Muslim countries, they're offended by the Bible. They think of Jesus, not only them, but also people in the world religions. They think of Jesus as a, prof a prophet, not as the Son of God, not as the Messiah, a Jesus who died on the cross. So they're offended by the Bible, but not them, but also other people in the world religions. So that's one of the reasons why it's called the World English Institute. In 2019, last year, there was over 30,000 World English Institute students from 200 countries who studied the Bible in 2019. Some of the countries that they had, such as Afghanistan, there was 514 students. Albania, 789. India, which is a big population country. It's got over 4,000 students. This is for 2019. That's how many students were interested in learning the English conversation, whether it's beginners, intermediate, or advanced. My son, who worked for Home Depot, he had student, or student, not students, fellow employees, I'll get it right, fellow employees in, from India that worked as IT people in Home Depot. Believe it or not, there's people in our countries, not just in America, that are really wanting to learn English. But not only English, India is well, well advanced in the IT area. A lot of people, when you talk to them on the phone, they're from India. Nigeria, over 1,000 people wanted to learn English and took the, were students as a um, World English Institute. Pakistan over almost 2,000 students. These are Muslim countries. So this, they use the, English, the Bible as their textbook to be able to teach them English. The U.S., 343. Now sometimes in your schools, such as Nashville, because I had fellow, fellow employees that I worked with, and they said some of the schools in Nashville ain't so great. And then I started to think this morning as I was driving here to worship, not only is there some people that can't speak English very good in America, but think of all the illegals or the legals or the immigrants that came to America. They want to learn English. So what better way to teach them is use the Bible as the instant or the Bible as a textbook. I'll get it right. <clears throat> the Philippines, almost 2000 students interested in learning English. These are just examples. Well, Jesus has given the Great Commission. We know from Matthew chapter 28, verses 19 and 20, Jesus says, Go into all the world and make disciples of all nations, baptize them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe to all that I commanded you. So the Great Commission was not only given to the disciples or the apostles, it's given to us. Jesus said in Luke 19, verse 10, he says, um, he came to seek and save the lost. If we're examples of Jesus Christ, or we're supposed to be the hands or the feet or the mouth of Jesus, are we not supposed to seek and save the lost? Jesus died for not only us, but for people in the world. In Matthew chapter 26, Jesus, when he instituted the Lord's Supper, he said this to his apostles. And now as they were eating, Jesus took bread and blessed and broke it and gave it to his disciples and said, Take and eat. This is my body. And he took a cup. When he had given thanks, he gave it to them, saying, Drink it, all of you, for this is my blood of the new covenant, which is poured out for many for the forgiveness of sins. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, we're so thankful for this day. We ask, Father, help us this, uh, this week and probably the following week. It's, been, it's, it's going to be extremely hot. The heat index is going to be over 100 degrees. And 
We ask, especially as you be with the elderly people because this is going to probably be the hardest on them. We're so thankful for your dear son, Jesus, for his willingness to come to this earth to live among us, for his example, for his life, for his love. We're thankful, Father, for Jesus being involved in the lives of people, no matter what nationality, what country, what language they spoke, Jesus was involved in their lives. We're thankful, Father, to be able to take of this bread, which represents your dear son's body, which was hung on the cross. We're thankful for this time period to be able to reflect upon you. Thank you so much for hearing our prayers. In Jesus' name, amen. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we're so thankful for your love, for your mercy, for your grace, for the forgiveness of sins that we have in Christ. We know, Father, that Jesus went through a lot for us. He was mocked, laughed at, had a crown of thorns put on his head and hidden in the head at times. He was whipped, having his flesh torn away by the whip, and he's nailed on that cross. We can see the pain, the anguish, the hurt as he went through all this for us. We're so thankful for your dear son Jesus and his willingness to die on that cross. He didn't need to, but he did it because he loved us very much. We're thankful, Father, to be able to take of the fruit of the vine, which represents your dear son's blood, which was shed on Calvary. Thank you so much for this time period that we have to, to come together upon the first day of the week to be able to take of this and reflect upon what Jesus has done for us. Thank you so much for hearing our prayers. In Jesus' name, amen. Oh, 
morning, church. If you have a Bible with you this morning, I invite you to turn to Acts chapter 12. Acts chapter 12, we will be there in just a few minutes. <clears throat> Actually skipping part of Acts chapter 11, only for this week. The reason being because in order to accomplish what we're going to try to accomplish next week, we need to talk about today's subject matter, as Scotty already mentioned, and if you could glean from the songs that we've sung, it is about prayer. So that having been said, I uh, invite you to go with me, bow with me for a word of prayer. <clears throat> oh, Holy Father, just thank you for your love and your mercy and your grace. And Father, please help us to be people who reflect all of that. Father, I ask now that you clear hearts and minds, the stresses of this world, the busyness of our lives, uh, those things that might distract us or weigh on us, that you just free us of that for the next little while. I thank you for every prayer that's already been prayed and every, every word spoken for every song sung that has pointed us toward this moment. And Father, I pray that our praise to you this morning has been the proper thank you that it's been intended to be. <clears throat> because we do thank you for working in our lives. And Father, I just ask now that you allow your spirit to speak through me. May this message be yours and yours alone. In the name of Jesus, I pray. Amen. Well, do you remember the first <clears throat> prayer that you learned to pray? For some of us, you know, that age might have varied. I'd say most of us were probably little, maybe three years old, four years old, something like that. I remember mine very clearly. It was simply a blessing. God is good. God is great. Let us thank him for our... God is great. God is good. So you're saying I learned it wrong. <laughs> well, all right. Well, all right. Let's stand and sing. <laughs> that's, that's the way. Man, the preacher just got heckled by his wife. Man. <laughs> <That's>, <laughs> thanks, babe. <laughs> Can't wait till we resume children's church. Okay, God is great, God is good. Okay, well, well, I learned it differently in Hawaii, okay? <laughs> the point being, think about those first words you teach a child. God's greatness and His goodness. Or as I learned it, God's goodness and His greatness. But either way. It doesn't change the fact that God is great and God is good. And so that's what we teach little ones and hope and pray that that takes root, don't we, church? That that takes root in their lives and that that is a seed that is planted that is going to flourish later on. Now, when we get to Acts 12... Uh, there are some events here that are positively miraculous. There are some events that are going on that are positively tragic. And there are some things that are going on that are simply maybe a little bit confusing. So let's dive in to Acts chapter 12, <clears throat> beginning with the first verse. It was about this time that King Herod arrested some who belonged to the church, intending to persecute them. 
he had James, the brother of John, put to death with the sword. When he saw that this met with approval among the Jews, he proceeded to seize Peter also. This happened during the festival of unleavened bread. After arresting him, he put him in prison, <coughs> handing him over to be guarded by four squads of four soldiers each. Herod intended to bring him out for public trial after the Passover. So Peter was kept in prison, but the church was earnestly praying to God for him. I'm going to stop there for just a little bit. Because the first thing we see is that James has what, church? He has been put to death. He's killed. Now, this had to have rocked the early Christians. And they are called Christians now. If, if Luke writes this chronologically, because he says it was at Antioch that they were first called Christians. Don't know if that's spread, how far that is spread yet. But nonetheless, for the early church, this had to rock them. Because how many times in Scripture do we hear those names, Peter, James, and John? Peter, James, and John. There is a time when about 72 disciples are sent out. We know very well that there is the 12. And I know I've talked on several occasions about that innermost circle. You think about your own lives. How many people do you trust? You may have 70 people that you call friends. Some of you have way more than that. I'm not talking about friends on social media, okay? That's, that's kind of a, a superficial level of friendship right there. But people that you actually consider friends, you may have, you may have a couple of dozen or so. But how many of those do you trust with the deepest, darkest stuff. How many of those do you really trust? And so Jesus, even with the twelve, he had that inner circle of Peter, James, and John. When he goes up to the mountain of transfiguration, who's there with him? Peter, James, and John. When he is called to go to the house where the synagogue leader Jairus is, has a daughter who is very sick and then even dies, who goes with him to the house? It's Peter, James, and John. When Jesus is pouring out his heart in the Garden of Gethsemane, who is there with him? Who does he ask to keep watch? And bless their hearts, they can't even stay awake. But nonetheless, who did he trust? It was Peter, James, and John. And so now James, part of that innermost circle of Jesus, has lost his life for the cause of Christ. Whew. And so now... We have the church concerned, no doubt, because Peter, who at this point is a preacher like no other, man, he has taken that boldness that we saw all through the gospel accounts, and now he has taken that to new heights. And he is proclaiming Jesus so boldly. And we know from reading all those Episodes, all those events in Acts up till now, that there were numerous occasions where not just a few, but many, many people came to know Christ as Lord because of His proclamations, because of His preaching. And now, right after James is killed, Peter is in jail. Now this Herod is the grandson of Herod the Great. This is Agrippa the First. And like his grandfather who wanted to kill Jesus as an infant, he is ruthless. And he saw 
that killing James pleased the Jews. And this is what people do when they lust for power. They begin to do things that are unreasonable. And for no reason now, he's got Peter in jail. And there's no doubt among any of the early church that Peter, after this so-called trial, is going to meet the very same fate that James already has. Now, it's kind of ironic here that they're celebrating the Passover. Because what does the Passover celebrate? It celebrates freedom. It celebrates God delivering, freeing His people from Egyptian bondage, from Egyptian captivity, and making them a holy people, a people set apart, bringing them into a place and letting them inherit the choicest land in the region. And yet, where is Peter? the chief proclaimer of the Savior of this same God, and he is taken captive. And so there he sits in a jail. Herod, no doubt, knows about what happened back in Acts chapter 5 when Peter leaves a jail. And so we're told here by Brother Luke that he puts... Not two, not four, not eight, it's 16 guards. Four squads, four each. 16 guards are guarding Peter. And so we move on in our story. Verse 6, the night before Herod was to bring him to trial, Peter was sleeping between two soldiers bound with two chains, and sentries stood guard at the entrance. Suddenly an angel of the Lord appeared, and a light shone in the cell. He struck Peter on the side and woke him up. Quick, get up, he said, and the chains fell off Peter's wrists. Then the angel said to him, put on your clothes and sandals, and Peter did so. Wrap your cloak around you and follow me, the angel told him. Peter followed him out of the prison, but he had no idea what the angel was doing and was really happening. What the angel was doing was really happening, excuse me. He thought he was seeing a vision. They passed the first and second guards and came to the iron gate leading to the city. It opened for them by itself, and they went through it. When they had walked the length of one street, suddenly the angel left him. Then Peter came to himself and said, Now I know without a doubt that the Lord has sent his angel and rescued me from Herod's clutches and from everything the Jewish people were hoping would happen. Now, the reason that Peter, I think, is in this kind of stupor right here is that he had resigned himself to the fact that he was going to meet the same fate of his brother in Christ, James. There was no doubt in his mind, I, I don't think. I, I don't think for a second, I don't doubt for a second, there was, he, he was 100% resolved that this, this, is, this is how it's going to end for me. This is it right here. And so he is kind of in this daze, and then he finally realizes what's going on. Verse 12, when this had dawned on him, he went to the house of Mary, the mother of John, also called Mark, where many people had gathered and were what church? Praying. Now it's also important to look at something that Luke tells us earlier in verse 5. So Peter was kept in prison, but the church was earnestly, what? Praying to God for him. Earnestly. It's this Greek word that really means to basically lay it all out. Have you ever prayed those prayers when you are, when, when you're just scared? Maybe you think you're about to lose somebody you love. 
I don't know the situation, but we've all, the, for all of you, but we've all, I think, been in that, in that point at some point, been in, in at that place where you just are laying it all out before God. And that's exactly what's going on here. When it says that the church is gathered and they are earnestly praying. We can't lose sight of that. God sent his angel, but what is the church doing? They are earnestly praying. The title of this morning's message is, The Work of Our Faith. Years ago, I was attending a youth worker conference at Lipscomb. Uh, this would have been uh, back in the, I guess back in the 90s. And uh, the preacher there, uh, one that I, that I enjoy listening anytime I get a chance to hear him, Chris Seedman. At the time, he was in Pensacola, Florida. Now he's in Texas. But that's neither here nor there. The fact is, he made a comment that stuck with me. He said, the real work is prayer. That the real work is prayer. You read Ephesians 6, and it, Paul's talking about the armor of God. The helmet, the sword, the belt, the footwear. All these components of the armor of God. Talking about the, the dark forces that are at work in this world. About you got to be ready. you got to be prepared to combat evil. But then if you keep on reading, what you learn is that what he's really talking about there is prayer. That prayer is how you combat evil. Church, we can learn a lesson from our early brothers and sisters in Christ. That when the going was getting toughest, when they were sincerely and legitimately fearing for the life of one of their leaders, one of the people that was closest to the Savior, someone who was proclaiming Christ as Lord so boldly, and they are laying it all out, saying, God, hear us. God, help us. God, do something. Save Peter. And so now, Peter's roaming free. Divine intervention, an act of God. I don't say that lightly. And so he gets to the house of Mary and her son, John Mark. Verse 13, Peter knocked at the outer entrance and a servant named Rhoda came to answer the door. When she recognized Peter's voice, she was so overjoyed that she ran back without opening, opening it and exclaimed, Peter is at the door. You're out of your mind, they told her. When she kept insisting that it was so, they said it must be his angel. So not only, I'm thinking church as I read this, not only has Peter resigned that he is a dead man, but the early church has too. Maybe it's his angel. But Peter kept on knocking, and when they opened the door and saw him, they were astonished. Peter motioned with his hand for them to be quiet and described how the Lord had brought him out of prison. Tell James and the other brothers and sisters about this, he said. And then he left for another place. In the morning, there was no small commotion among the soldiers as to what had become of Peter. After Herod had a thorough search made for him and did not find him, he cross-examined the guards and ordered that they be executed. Right, church? Just further proof that this king is as ruthless as his reputation that precedes him. 
Now, we may wonder, okay, if God saves Peter, why didn't he save James? He could have, couldn't he? Yeah, he could have. And that might lead us this morning to say, why? Why? One of my Lipscomb professors who wrote a wonderful book on Acts writes this. What is hard for us to understand in the story is that God was in no less control when James died just as much as when he freed Peter. Why did he not free James? Who can discern the ways of God? This, however, we know. God was then and is now in control. Amen, church family? If our witness is finished and He allows us to come home to Him through physical death, who are we to argue against His purposes for our lives? Now, to people who are skeptical of the Christian faith, they look at that and they say, oh, that's, that's convenient. You praise God when He lets somebody miraculously out of jail bypassing all those guards but then you praise God when somebody loses their head when somebody dies for the cause you give praise to God then as well and my only response is absolutely absolutely because this world is not our what, church? You got it. Amen. You got it. This world is not our home. This is temporary. Eternity is going to be a very, very long time. And for those of us that profess Jesus as Lord... We're going to bask in the glow of a loving Father for eternity. And man, man, do I love that idea. And so we finish the story. Luke gives us a Hollywood ending. Because don't we like it when the bad guys get their comeuppance? Don't we like it when people get what's coming to them? And this is a reminder that as much as we want to take revenge, we leave revenge to God. He's the divine judge. And He can accomplish what we never can. Then Herod went from Judea to Caesarea and stayed there. He had been quarreling with the people of Tyre and Sidon. They now joined together and sought an audience with him. After securing the support of Blastus, a trusted personal servant of the king, they asked for peace because they depended on the king's country for their food supply. On the appointed day, Herod, wearing his royal robes, sat on his throne and delivered a public address to the people. They shouted, this is the voice of a God, not a man. Immediately, because Herod did not give praise to God, an angel of the Lord struck him down. And he was eaten by worms and died. But the word of God continued to spread and flourish. And in ways that we don't always see every day, it continues to spread and flourish today. I don't go more than 48, maybe 72 hours, two or three days tops before I get an email from Alfred Bayan. 
And some of you that are friends with him on Facebook, you see the same pictures that he sends me through email. You see some of those same pictures. There's also another guy in another part of that same city of Monrovia. I think his, his name is, is Edmund Borfay or something like that. And again, same with him. You don't go more than two or three days. These guys are constantly having Bible studies. It is a region of the world where, where people are receptive to the gospel. The World Bank just determined that Liberia is the poorest country on the entire planet. And so it makes sense that a people who have so little would hope for so much. And by that same token, it doesn't surprise me, and it may not you either, that we living in what is still the, the biggest economy on the planet, the wealthiest nation on the planet, that people are still convinced that human reasoning and human devices, that human ingenuity, that hard work, that creativity can get them everything they need. And I pray that they will hear the message of the gospel of Jesus Christ and accept it. Because yes, hard work is valuable. Creativity is wonderful. Human ingenuity. The reason that God gave us, the, that, that the ability that He gave us to reason that sets us apart from the other creatures that he inhabited the earth with. That's all well and good. But if we rely on ourselves, we end up just like Herod. That human reasoning, if that's all you have, it will make life hell. And I use that metaphorically and literally. Metaphorically in the sense that there's going to come a time in your life where you have nowhere else to turn. There's going to come a time in your life when things just don't make sense. When you simply have no hope. And then of course in the literal sense that God, just as He reminds us here in Acts 12, that He is divine judge. As loving and gracious and merciful as He can be, that He does occupy the judge's seat. And people will be judged. Now, that verse that Jeff read a while ago, that verse that, that said that you know essentially says what we ask for we'll get if we are people who keep his commandments in other words if we're in right standing with god he will bless us jeremiah 11 is i'm sorry jeremiah 29 it's verse 11 that many people are very familiar with but my favorite part of that is verse 12 of Jeremiah 29. Because after verse 11 it says, For I know the plans I have for you, declares the Lord, plans to prosper you and not to harm you, plans to give you hope and a future. There's this verse that says, Then you will call on me and come and pray to me. And I will listen to you. You will seek me and find me when you seek me with all your heart. God is telling us, church, I am right here. I am right here. I'm not going to hide from you. I'm not going to make this difficult. If you seek me, you will find me. All you have to do is give me your heart. That's all he asks of us, church, that we give him our heart. The last thing I want to say in closing, reading from that same book, 
when appropriate, God will deliver. At other times, God delivers His faithful servants through death itself. It is not ours to question His purposes. It is ours to pray that His will be done and beg for the wisdom to be a part of what He is doing in our world. Make, make no mistake about it, God is in control. Sovereign Lord, teach us to trust Your ways. Church family, the work of our faith is not the ministries we might undertake. It's not the things that we do one-on-one -on -one when we're given an opportunity to help someone, to listen to someone, to love someone. The work of our faith is prayer. Everything else is a manifestation, a result of our prayer life. Let's be people who learn to pray earnestly on a regular basis. That we are people who know when appropriate how to lay it all out there to a God who says, if you seek me, you will find me if you simply seek me with your entire heart. That's a God I want to serve. That's a God that I'm honored to pray to. One who says, children, I am right here. If you are not with us this morning, then we offer the invitation so that you can change the trajectory of your life forever, so that you can share in this hope, so that you can begin an earnest prayer life. If you're with us this morning and you need to, uh, to unburden yourself from something that's weighing on you and, and have a church family that prays with you and over you, then the invitation is for that reason as well. Let's stand together and sing.